of uh, this uh, first session is going to be the Bayesian foundations of phylogenetic and phylogenomic inference. Um, there's not so much about R in this talk, um, but uh, this is uh, more leaning on the, the Bayesian inference side um, and a particular application of Bayesian inference uh, that uh, our, our research group at, here at uh, the BSSC at ETH is uh, involved heavily with. So it's okay if you don't understand all of these words yet. I mean, I, I'm sure at this point in the course, you understand uh, Bayesian, um, phylogenetic, uh, probably a lot of you do, phylogenomic, maybe uh, less of you do. Um, but uh, that is the purpose of this talk, to, to introduce these concepts. Um, but uh, before I do, I just want to um, describe the outline here. So. Uh, this talk will be structured is that the first hour um, I'm going to cover these uh, or attempt to cover these these uh, four initial points. We're going to talk about phylogenetics, phylogenomics, how we use Bayesian inference to, to wrap this all together. Um, and uh, we're going to discuss a particular application of these methods. Um, the last half hour, if we have time, I'd like uh, you to be able to spend some time at least starting a BEAST2 tutorial uh, where uh, you will get a chance to actually try out some of the software that um, I'm talking about today. And as Patricia mentioned, please feel free to jump in at any point with your questions. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to... Uh, warm into this uh, very slowly, um, this first thing in the morning, so I guess that that's appropriate. Um, and I'm, uh, apologies if this is uh, this is not new for, for some of you, um, but just so that everyone's on the same page, I'm going to start right at the beginning with phylogenies and um, talking about sequence evolution. Now, I'm just going to move some of my windows out of the way so I can see what I'm I'm talking about. Okay, so we're going to uh, just right back to the beginning. What is a phylogenetic tree? I mean, if you if you type phylogenetic tree into Wikipedia and read the first paragraph of the article that comes up, you'll find something like this: a phylogenetic tree is a branching diagram showing the inferred evolutionary relationships among various biological species or other entities based on similarities and differences in their physical or genetic characteristics. And this, this based on similarities or differences means that this is this is this phylogenetic uh, tree is not something that we directly observe usually. Um, it, it's something that we have to infer from uh, uh, data, um, notably these, these similarities and differences in physical and genetic characteristics. So that process of connecting these things to an actual tree is, is um, the topic that we're addressing here. Okay, <clears throat> now this concept of a tree uh, in biology goes back a very long way. If you go right back to the beginning, yeah, you, you see these uh, diagrams where um, people were uh, ordering all living things um, or uh, starting from the, the simplest things, uh, what they consider simplest things, right up to complex uh, uh, humans and then some divine being at the top um, uh, a long time ago. Um, and then much more recently, although uh, from our standpoint, still a long time ago, around uh, the, the time of Darwin, um, but just before Darwin, people were already... Um, starting to uh, organize species in tree structures. So these, this figure here is this beautiful um, depiction of uh, the relationship between the appearance of species in various geological time periods um, by uh, this person, Edward Hitchcock, who uh, incidentally was a, a critic of Darwin's uh, theories and uh, removed these figures from his textbook uh, once they started to be regarded as, um, as evolutionary trees. But regardless, um, the, the idea existed. Um, of course, Charles Darwin was the first to um, uh, actually regard these, these branching patterns as being uh, a depiction of some evolutionary process where species um, 
uh, transitioned from one to another. Um, and one of the first, well, the first known depiction of a what, what we would now call a phylogenetic tree uh, comes from a one of Darwin's notebooks. Um, and here, this is a very rough sketch. You can see that, that there's some um, uh, there's a tree that relates um, some some token species A, B, C, D here at the leaves, and uh, the, the tree here is meant to represent the the concept that. Um, some of these species are more closely related to one another um, than others. Um, note that there's no uh, sense in which uh, time is shown in this figure. Um, in contrast to this figure over here on the right-hand side, which is uh, from, it, it's the only figure from Darwin's uh, book on the origin of species. And uh, what it displays is again this branching pattern, but here on the vertical axis, we've actually got time uh, increasing up the page. Uh, so you can follow these, these lineages and at each of these points here, you see that there's, there's uh, a burst of speciation with lots and lots of different uh, species being produced and only some of them surviving to the present. And this brings us to uh, what we now consider a phylogenetic tree. This is a, a more modern depiction over here on the right, still a very schematic depiction um, showing the relationship between uh, humans and chimps and other primates. Um, and these trees, as the Wikipedia article said, are inferred from characteristics of the entities that they relate. Um, these characteristics are often genetic, they, but they don't have to be. Um, they can be, for instance, phenotypic. This is a very important um, type of data to include if you're considering uh, um, trees derived from fossils, because we don't often have DNA um, associated with fossils, but we, we uh, can um, measure um, certain um, phenotypic characters uh, on the fossils and use these to reconstruct phylogeny as well. Okay. Um, one thing that's very important, I think, uh, even at the beginning to uh, point out is that uh, phylogenetic trees don't just occur at one level. Um, so in particular, um, we can consider in the, in the context of macroevolution, we can consider um, phylogenies uh, relating species on one level. So this is uh, what we've been discussing so far. Um, so here we have the, this larger tree, if you ignore the little lines in between, um, this is a species tree where the, the leaves here, the tips are A, B, C, D, and E. These are five uh, different species that are related by this tree. Um, however, from each of these species, one can imagine collecting some genetic data say uh, some marker gene that is uh, sampled from multiple individuals uh, belonging to that species, and then using the genetic data in those uh, sequences to infer phylogenetic relationships between, um, uh, uh, between those, those uh, individual gene samples. Um, and those phylogenetic relationships are what are displayed by these thin lines uh, within the, the fatter lines here. And this is what we call a gene tree. And the important thing to know is that while the species tree here does constrain the shape of the gene tree in the sense that uh, you can't have um, a common ancestor between one of these lineages in B and one of these lineages in A before this speciation event occurs, um, but uh, it doesn't uh, completely determine the shape of the gene tree. So uh, you can see there's a lot of differences between the shape of these gene trees and the, the shape of the species tree. Um, and there's a, a really nice um, uh, uh, analogy here between this relationship, this, this nested tree structure, and what we see um, in uh, uh, pathogen evolution uh, during an epidemic. So uh, we can talk about a transmission tree being the relationship between uh, infected hosts within an epidemic. Um, and that's sort of analogous to this species tree. And you can also talk about the, 
pathogen phylogeny is derived from sequencing the um, pathogen genomes. And that would be the analog of the gene tree here. <clears throat> okay. Um, another important thing to, to point out at the beginning is this so-called neutrality assumption. Um, and the thing is that in statistical phylogenetics, um, the way it's applied, the common assumption is that the shape of the tree affects the distribution of characters, but not the other way around. So uh, in order to visualize this, if you consider this, this tree here, don't worry about the details, um, and uh, then consider these sequences that are associated with each of the leaves. So these are our, say, present day samples. Um, and this is the phylogenetic relationship between these individuals um, going right back to a common ancestor at the root here. Now, the way in which we assume this data could have been generated, of course, it wasn't generated this way, but um, uh, the way we assume it could have been generated is that the tree existed first and then uh, we, we choose a random sequence uh, to apply to the root and then just evolve it according to some process that we'll talk about later down these edges until it gets to the leaves. Now, the important point about this is that the sequence then um, has no say in the shape of this tree. Um, the, the shape of the tree determines the sequences that we observe. Um, but for instance, the speciation rate or the birth rate um, of uh, along lineages in this tree is not determined by this particular sequence that's carried. And of course, that's not true in reality. Uh, in, in, in general, in biology, of course, it's very important uh, that the uh, sequence um, plays a role in determining uh, the fitness of an individual. Um, but uh, in, it's, it's important uh, that um, uh, uh, we, we can still make headway with this assumption, provided we steer clear of sequences that actually code for things that are involved in selection. So it's, it's possible to satisfy this assumption with, with real data, but of course it's not in general true. Okay, so if we have these sequences, the phylogenetic inference problem is to take these sequences and basically perform some clustering um, to produce a tree. And of course, you can do this in several different ways. Uh, and, and in general, this is a very easy problem, um, the, the very crude clustering problem. And there are some very crude approaches to it. Um, but... Uh, the result of this would just be a diagram like this, where um, these uh, we we have maybe an ordering of of um, of uh, merging between um, the the different samples that we have, um, but we don't really have uh, much uh, insight into what the length of these branches mean um, and the uncertainty associated with um, the the overall topology of the tree. So the question is, can we do better than this? Um, and this is the topic um, that we'll be discussing. So the way we, we do this is we, we sort of take a, a more model-based approach and we consider, again, a tree like this. Um, and we imagine that there's some arbitrary sequence assigned to the, the root of this tree or the, 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 the first lineage of this tree. And this uh, first sequence evolves according to uh, some process uh, that is uh, described by this mysterious Q uh, variable here. Um, and this gives us our sequences at the end. Now, the question is, what is this Q? Um, and it's really not that complicated. The sorts of models that we choose are these uh, very basic continuous time Markov chain models. So this is basically a, a, a model in which a given sequence is undergoing discrete uh, changes um, at random times. And the, uh, the rate of all these changes um, depends only on the, the current state of the sequence. So it's Markovian. 
Um, the way we can set this up is we start, I, I know it's a little bit early in the morning to start discussing maths, but I'm, I'm sorry about this. This is the way it's going to be. Um, if we consider this P sub T super I to be the probability that a nucleotide at site I, so this is uh, site I, um, and at time T uh, has uh, state X. So X could be G, T, C, or A. Um, and the time development of this probability distribution over the possible uh, characters at this particular site at this particular time is determined by this transition rate matrix Q. And I apologize for the next <laughs> little bit, but it's uh, it's really not as bad as it seems. Um, so this is just saying that the this probability distribution um, for the character at a particular site at time t plus delta t or t plus dt. So so after some some tiny time increment. Um, is uh, given by the uh, the matrix, this matrix product, um, the product between this matrix and the uh, probability distribution at the earlier time, okay? And this matrix here uh, is the so-called uh, trans transition probability matrix. Um, and the, the matrix, the little matrix here, this Q matrix is the transition rate matrix. And it's composed simply of the uh, individual rates of transitioning from any um, starting character to any uh, ending character uh, in, in some uh, infinitesimal time unit. Okay. So for instance, QGA is the, the rate of transitioning from G to A. Um, G to C, G to T, and so on. Don't worry so much about the diagonal elements here. They're just uh, there to make uh, the maths easier. Um, okay, and the only difference between the different substitution models um, that we consider in uh, statistical phylogenetics uh, is the transition rate matrix for the most part. So um, really they all have this structure. Um, and usually the average rate of substitution, so which is often called mu, is factored out of the trans trans uh, transition matrix. Um, so we usually think of uh, time um, being expressed in units of average number of substitutions. Just remember that you can ask questions at any time. Okay, so the simplest model um, of this kind is the so-called Jukes-Cantor model. Um, and it's the simplest because it just assumes that the transition rate um, between any pair of character states is the same. Um, so uh, that's why we have all these one thirds here because say st we're starting from character G, um, the, the possible transi transitions are to T, C, or A. Um, so there's three possibilities, and uh, there's a normalized rate of one third uh, to each of these different possibilities. Um, so it's a very boring sort of model um, in the sense that it doesn't include a lot of biological detail. Um, in particular, um, there's no difference here between the rates of transition and transversions. So, um, so for instance, uh, the the transition rate between sorry tr um, the 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 rate of change from uh, G to A um, versus G to C is is the same, and this is um, not uh, what we really want in a biologically reasonable model. Um, the other thing about this very simple model is that the equilibrium distribution is uniform, and what this means is that if you take if you imagine a single site and you evolve this uh, this single site according to this model, eventually, if you do this long enough, even if you start with a known character at this site, um, eventually, after a long time, uh, you're equally likely to be in any of the uh, um, uh, any of the possible um, states, uh, and this. Maybe um, 
doesn't seem too like a, too much of a problem. But um, the reality is that if if we consider real sequence evolution, generally, um, if you count the the number of G's, T's, C's, and A's across a real sequence, um, it's going to have some bias um, to um, uh, particular characters as opposed to others. So it makes sense to encode that sort of information in the um, substitution model. And that's not the case here. Um, but despite this, the Jukes Cantor is a useful toy model because it lets us think a little bit about um, the way sequence evolution happens. And in particular, uh, we can uh, easily compute things like this P diff. Now, this is the probability that a nucleotide um, at uh, a starting point in time, um, uh, when we consider uh, uh, this uh, character evolving over a certain amount of time t, winds up being in a different state, having a different character to the, the starting character. Um, and uh, keep in mind that this is not the probability that the, uh, the site undergoes a substitution or undergoes a, a, a mutation. Um, this is only counting the probability of winding up in a different state. So if we start with G, this is the probability of the ending um, state being uh, C, T, or A. Okay, and if we plot this, uh, what we see is, is this red line here. So we see that it starts at zero. Of course, uh, we, we start in the, the same state. So when we're, we're moving some infinitesimal time after this, we're likely to have remained in the same state. So P diff is zero, but it uh, quickly increases and increases linearly initially. But then you can see that it asymptotes to some value, and this value happens to be 0.75. And this is basically saying that after a long enough time, you're equally likely to be any in any of the four characters. So your chance of being uh, different to the starting state is 75% because there's a 25% chance that you just by by chance. Um, wind up in the same character as the starting character. Um, this is important for thinking about inference because really these differences are the raw material that we're using to infer phylogeny. Um, so um, if, uh, if, if we're somewhere near the start here, um, then we can take these, um, these uh, differences in the characters that we observe and use them quite reliably to estimate the time um, that, um, that has existed, the evolutionary time that's existed between the pair of sequences. If, on the other hand, we're looking at um, a pair of sequences that are uh, both at saturation up here, then it's going to be very difficult to rely reliably infer uh, the, the time between these sequences. Um, so, I mean, a basic way that you could infer this time is to use this, this estimator, which is just a, a basic rough as guts, no Bayesian here, um, me method of moments sort of uh, estimator, where we're basically taking um, these, um, these, these differences in, in the relative frequencies of characters and turning them back into Ts. And um, this becomes unstable if you um, numerically unstable if you are trying to um, uh, measure the evolutionary time separating sequences um, that are at saturation, so-called saturation. Okay. Now, as I promised, that that was a that was a simple example, the Jukes Cantor model. Um, there are much more uh, clever sort of uh, substitution models out there. Uh, of course, they're all falling far short of biological reality, but um, they're at least a little bit closer. So this so-called HKY substitution model, named after these authors here, um, it ticks many of the boxes that uh, the, uh, the Jukes-Cantor model didn't. So it allows for non-equilibrium base frequencies. So if you run this model for long enough, um, you uh, get to a um, an equilibrium distribution that's actually parameterized by these little these pies that appear in the substitution rate matrix. Um, it includes also this transition transversion rate ratio kappa. So um, by setting this kappa not equal to one, we allow the um, there to be a difference in rates between transitions and transversions. 
Um, and these two things mean that it's arguably the simplest sensible model of mutual DNA evolution out there. At least uh, that's commonly used for phylogenetics. Um, going beyond the HKY model, there, there are more general models. Uh, a, a commonly used general model is the so-called GTR model or general time re reversible model. Um, and uh, this is the most general um, time reversible model. So time reversibility is a, a technical characteristic that is um, sometimes desirable for um, actually performing inference. Um, but uh, I won't go into it here. Uh, this model has 10 parameters, um, nine if you if you divide out the average substitution rate. Um, and all of the other time reversible models are special cases of this. So HKY is a special case of this, Jukes Cantor is a special case of this. Okay. So going back to this uh, this abstract picture of a tree. Um, we have our starting sequence, it evolves down the tree. We have our um, sequences that we observe at the, at the leaves. Um, now, these sequences constitute our alignment. Um, uh, and one thing to maybe um, point out here is that, of course, we've omitted any discussion of insertions and deletions uh, in this um, uh, in this process of molecular evolution. Um, and for this reason, when we're talking about our sequence data, we're only ever really talking about an aligned um, set of sequences. Um, we assume this has already taken place. Okay, and if we call out tree T, um, then what we can do given that we've got this, this transition rate matrix and this understanding of what it means, um, we can compute the probability of our sequence alignment given the tree and given this transition rate matrix and our equilibrium uh, um, parameters. Um, okay, and this is something that is actually very easy to compute um, in linear time using dynamic programming. Um, there's a special algorithm known as Felsen Science Pruning Algorithm that does exactly this. Um, and this integrates over any, all of the things that we don't hit, uh, don't know. So we don't need to know the um, the sequences at the ancestral nodes here, although maybe you want to, but we don't need to know those to compute the probability of the alignment that we observe given a tree. So that's very handy. Um, and this is very important because it's the basis for Bayesian phylogenetic inference. So this is our likelihood in this case. Does anyone have any uh, questions on this section? No, okay, if not, I'll go on. So that was phylogenetics. That's really all I'm going to discuss on that topic. Phylogenomics is taking this really a step further. So this is a pretty buzzwordy term, um, but it's been around for a long time now, so uh, I, I can't feel too bad for, for using it. It was introduced by uh, authors Grenfell and others in 2004 in the context of epi uh, epidemiology. Um, and in their paper, they described this as the interplay between immunodynamics, epidemiology, and evolutionary biology, um, and the effect this has on the shape of pathogen phylogenies. And this is uh, quite a... Um, there's, there's, uh, this is introducing more, more buzzwords, um, but uh, in the end, it's actually a fairly simple concept. The idea is that the, um, the, the population level process, be it an uh, epidemic or, um, or um, population dynamics in, in some um, other population, so, so some, some population of animals, for instance, um, or number of species uh, varying through time, all of these things affect the shape of the tree. Um, so uh, for instance, if we have a population that's growing exponentially, uh, we might uh, expect to see a certain kind of tree with, with long pendant edges like this. 
if we have constant population size, we have a, um, a slightly differently shaped tree. Um, if we have some structure in the um, population, then this can also affect the tree. Um, if we have some, uh, some uh, non-neutral evolution going on, so some selection, uh, this also affects the, the shape of the tree. And so the idea behind um, phylogenomics is to make use of this relationship between the shape of the tree and what's going on at the population level to try to use uh, inferred phylogenetic trees to further infer properties of the populations within which they're embedded. Um, just uh, some more examples of this. Uh, here we see several different pathogen trees. So this is a measles phylogeny. This is an influenza A phylogeny. Um, this is a dengue virus phylogeny. And the point here is that these all have qualitatively different um, shapes. Like the overall picture here is, is very clearly um, uh, different. Um, in particular, this uh, this ladder-like uh, tree structure for influenza is uh, very well known and very reproducible, as is this structure for dengue virus. Um, and so there's something going on and something we, that we can learn about um, just based on the the structure of these on the shape of these trees. And phylogenomics is the way that we we aim to do this in a quantitative uh, fashion. So basically. The question that phylogenomics seeks to answer is what does a phylogenetic tree tell us about a population? And places the emphasis on the population itself um, instead of the subset of individuals that happen to be involved in a particular phylogeny. Um, and this is a really important point because it's, it's often the case when you're studying um, phylogenetics, um, phylogenies of species, that the actual phylogeny is of real interest itself. Um, you really care whether humans and chimps um, diverged um, at a particular point in time or another particular or another point in time. Um, but if you're looking at, say, uh, the um, phylogeny of uh, a bunch of SARS-CoV-2 samples uh, that have been taken from an epidemic, the particular tree that you infer from those sequences is not necessarily of interest. Uh, it's a very ephemeral thing. Um, it's going to be different for every uh, uh, COVID outbreak that you uh, look at. Um, but what you are interested in is the the population level process that generated that tree. And that's where follow dynamics com comes in. Um, of course, population can mean a lot of different things. We can, we've talked about viruses. We've talked about animals, but we can also be species. So, so this is uh, very broadly applicable. Um, okay, so how do we do this? So in order to infer characteristics of a population from a tree, we need to model the tree generation process. Just like when we need, when we wanted to model, the, when we wanted to connect sequences to a tree, we need to model the process of sequence evolution down the tree. When we want to connect the, the tree to a population, we want to model the process of generating the tree from a population. Um, there are two main families of models that we will discuss. The so-called birth death sampling models uh, assume that this tree is the result of a population evolving under a forward time birth death model um, with an explicit sampling process. And then we have uh, coalescent models, which are more retrospective, retrospective models uh, that assume the tree is a result of this backward in time process that successively merges pairs of lineages together um, and uh, relates the rate of the, that merging process to the um, population size. So just to briefly introduce these two, uh, a birth death uh, sampling model you might introduce, you might depict this way. So this box here represents a single compartment of individuals. This represents a population. Um, these could be infected hosts. This is why I've written I here, but it could also be species. Um, and uh, members of this population uh, undergo several different kinds of events. So we have um, events, uh, we have birth events that occur at rate lambda that result in 
uh, new individuals being added to this population. Uh, we've got some uh, overall death rate new, not to be confused with mutation rate. Um, and uh, we can also say that a, a subset of the individuals that are removed are sampled, become our, our samples with, with probability S. And there are many different kinds of birth death sampling models. This is just one. Um, but we also have the length of the process defined. So you can you can run, you can simulate such a process. Um, and if you keep track of all of the birth events that occurred, all the death events and all the sampling events, uh, then you can reconstruct, then you can, then you can um you can build a uh, phylogenetic tree uh, from those samples. So this uh, you'll have to believe me, but uh, we can this this kind of process allows us to compute the probability of a tree given these parameters that we've discussed. Um, so you're given the birth rate, death rate, sampling proportion, and this uh, length of the process to your. On the other hand, we have these coalescent models. As I said, these are more closely related to the the population size, um, and one way you can imagine a coalescent model is that you start with a basic right Fisher model. We have um, some uh, uh, individuals here um, belonging to one generation um, of a population. So uh, the, the total number of individuals in this population is very small. It's just the number of circles on this line. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And three of these have been sampled. These ones are the, the colored um, circles here. And now we consider um, the previous generation. So this model, we assume that the, the population size is fixed. It doesn't change. So we've got the same number of circles on the, on the next row corresponding to the previous generation. Um, and the question becomes, what is the probability that we see a merging between uh, any pair of these, uh, these colored individuals? Um, in other words, what's the probability that any pair of them share a common ancestor in the previous generation. Um, now, under the right fisher model, the way we relate individuals to their parents in the previous generation is that we just allow each child to randomly sample its parent uniformly from the previous generation. So this is making assumptions about you know, how well mixed the population is, random mating, et cetera. Um, but um, so it's, it really is just a, a very basic model. Uh, but still, uh, that's the assumption. And given that assumption, we can approximate the um, probability of a so-called coalescence or one of these uh, common ancestors being found in the previous generation to be just the number of pairs that exist uh, between um, uh, the, the members of our, our sample set uh, multiplied by one on n. Because the, the probability of any two individuals in generation I sharing a common ancestor in generation I minus one under this assumption of, of random mating is just one on N. Okay, oh, and this is an approximation. Um, obviously this is ignoring the possibility that um, one parent could be the common ancestor for all three uh, individuals, um, but in the case where the number of uh, green dots is much, much bigger than the number of red dots, then um, this, uh, this probability um, becomes essentially zero and the approximation becomes um, perfect. Okay, so with these uh, probabilities, you can then compute um, the, uh, well, you can, you can simulate a, um, uh, a tree starting from uh, these sampled individuals uh, going up the page. Um, and overall, the rate of coalescence is just the number of pairs um, between the number of lineages at the particular time multiplied by one on N. So we see that the population size appears um, in the, the rate of coalescence as we go back in time. And this allows us to, once, once we uh, make a, a large population assumption and, uh, and, and um, uh, assume that we're operating on timescales where we can assume that uh, the, the, uh, um, the, the time is no longer discrete, but rather continuous, uh, 
um, we can use this use these rates to write down the probability of a tree um, given the uh, population size. And actually there's this NG here because it's actually the population size multiplied by the generation time uh, that's important. Um, uh, you can't really disentangle these two things to, together, but we, we often just write N, uh, but it's important to keep in mind that uh, generation time uh, is a factor here as well. Um, Okay, so so that's the coalescent uh, sort of approach. But in general, um, the idea here is that we've got some population dynamic through time. Um, we have some samples uh, that occur at different times. Um, and these samples in combination with this, um, this population size dynamic uh, give rise to this uh, phylogenetic tree distribution. And this allows us to write down the probability of the tree given eta, where eta are either the birth death parameters or the coalescent rate function. Um, and this is our phylogenetic likelihood. So this is uh, where we can turn the, this probability distribution around and talk about the probability, um, uh, de describe it as the likelihood of eta given, um, given t. Okay, so this is already hinting at what we want to do now, which is to wrap all of these things together in a um, Bayesian uh, framework. Um, and the way we do this, I mean, it's 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 not particularly, it's not rocket science. Um, basically all we're doing here is we're taking our uh, phylogenetic likelihood, this uh, probability of our sequence alignment given the tree and our substitution rate matrix, and multiplying that by the phylogenetic likelihood, the probability of the tree given, pardon me, our population um, model parameters eta. And then finally, we have our parameter priors on the substitution rate matrix and our um, phylogenetic parameters. And this is all normalized by uh, this marginal likelihood down here for the, um, this is the probability of the, the sequence alignment integrated over all of these uh, unknown parameters and objects. Um, but on the left-hand side, we have the target of our inference, which is the posterior probability over both the tree, the substitution rate matrix and the um, um, followed dynamic parameters. Um, so that's the goal. And the, the nice thing here is that if we can characterize this object, then um, we can uh, we, we, we automatically get um, uh, a measure of uh, uncertainty in all of our, our various inferences. Um, and by uh, including uh, appropriate prior information, we can include other sources of information in the inference quite naturally and easily. Um, okay, this is what I just discussed. Um, okay. So that all sounds wonderful and very easy. And uh, why is this even uh, difficult? Well, uh, it's difficult because integration is difficult. Um, and in particular, if we look at just Bayes theorem in general, uh, we have this denominator, which I mentioned was the marginal likelihood. Um, this is just the probability of the data given the the model assumptions that we're um, that we're making. Um, and this uh, you can think of as just a normalizing constant for the posterior distribution. Um, and as such, it uh, is equal to just integrating the top line of the the numerator of this um, uh, this fraction. Uh, over uh, all of the possible model parameters. Um, and the difficulty is that uh, we can't solve this integral um, for most problems of interest because the, the parameter space is just far too large. Um, and usually we can't even sort of just brute force numerically do this either. Um, so we need another approach. And, and the approach we take, and I'm sure uh, this has come up already in the course, um, is to uh, go to Monte Carlo, and uh, in particular, this uh, casino in Monte Carlo, which was the inspiration for the name of Monte Carlo Methods, 
Um, and these Monte Carlo methods are algorithms which produce random samples of values in order to characterize a probability distribution over those values. So if our goal is to characterize this posterior distribution, um, we're going to use Monte Carlo methods to, uh, to do this. Um, and uh, ideally, these algorithms would produce arbitrary uh, numbers of independent samples of the, the parameters that we're trying to um, uh, characterize the posterior distribution for. Um, but uh, in practice, uh, we're usually stuck with so-called Metropolis Hastings Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, so this is an algorithm uh, that produces samples that is capable uh, in principle of producing samples from a distribution, say f of x, by generating a random walk over possible values of x. So if we imagine this is um, this is our f of x here, it's a very simple one in this case for illustrative purposes. And this is our starting value of x, somewhere around 0.5. Um, and the way this algorithm proceeds is that we make some modification of x. So for instance, we could draw a new value of x from within some, uh, some window um, that, that we just define arbitrarily. So we say this window is point, point 0.2 or something. Um, and uh, if, the, uh, if the new value of x is, has a higher um, probability than the old value, according to this distribution, then uh, we immediately make this the new value and go there and repeat this process. If it's the case that the new value is a lower probability, then we still make the move downwards, um, but only with a probability that's equal to the ratio between the, um, this, this lower probability and the original higher probability. So this is less than one. So there's a chance um, for downward steps that you stay where you are. Um, Okay, and so this is a biased random walk that uh, tends to explore the most uh, highly probable areas of the probability surface. And the important thing is that the only um, place that F appears, the, the probability appears, is in this ratio of the probability of the new value to the probability of the old value. And so what this means is that we don't need to normalize F. So in other words, we don't need to compute that horrible um, marginal likelihood. Um, that it was causing us pain. So this is what we use for tree inference. Um, but of course, trees are a very different space to, um, to just uh, real numbers. And so the picture is a little bit different for trees, although in our heads, we can still think of this random walk on the real number line. Um, but in reality, what we're having to do when we're uh, doing MCMC with trees is to make these local modifications to, uh, to a phylogenetic tree um, using a wide variety of, of different uh, proposal distributions. Um, and the, here are just some examples of moves that you, you sometimes see in these uh, kinds of algorithms. So for instance, moves where you take, these are sort of truncated um, portions of trees, by the way, this is what these dotted lines represent. So I'm just saying, you know, this is a portion of a tree and we've got some, uh, some subtree down here and we disconnect it from, uh, so this would be a randomly chosen subtree and we just disconnect it from wherever it's attached to and reattach it to uh, some other random point in the, in the tree. Um, and then you have other things where, where you might have two subtrees selected and you uh, just swap them. And um, obviously you need to sample node heights as well. So you can move them up and down and uh, you can do things like scale the whole tree. Um, but really the only thing that matters for MCMC is that uh, we're able to get from any single tree to any other um, uh, tree that, that has um, a non-zero probability, posterior probability um, in, uh, our, um, uh, in our distribution. So as long as that's the case, uh, then as long if you run this algorithm for long enough, you will eventually get to um, a correct answer. Um, when you run MCMC, this is again hopping back to the 
uh, the the real number case. So we've got our x here, and we're running this for we're running this MCMC algorithm for a large number of steps. You can see that it it's uh, initially uh, at some starting value that's arbitrarily chosen. Um, it has nothing to do with the actual uh, distribution we're trying to characterize. But then it uh, converges in this case very quickly to um, uh, this point where it's actually uh, belonging to, to um, the uh, the portion of the state space that has actual um, support under the um, probability distribution. So, and then it, it's just wiggling up and down um, um, in this in this point. Okay, and if we take uh, the uh, these um, values that have been visited by this algorithm. So this would just be a, a big long column of numbers, uh, one for each step. And we uh, plot the, uh, we, we sort of uh, compute the probability density or relative uh, frequency of, of um, visiting uh, um, these different points in the state space. And we compare this to the target um, distribution f of x, you can see that after a long enough time, we start to see this MCMC um, histogram looking more like more like this this dot this dashed line that we're actually uh, trying to target. Okay. Um, of course, you know there there are some details here. So the fact that we start from an arbitrary point um, means that uh, this first period of the the chain is uh, is going to be biased. It's going to have really nothing to do with the actual probability distribution we're trying to characterize. Um, and so we we usually call this the burn-in period and we we try to discard it somehow before we're um, actually analyzing our samples. Um, but just in general, it's good to keep in mind that because of the way MCMC works, adjacent uh, MCMC samples are correlated. So, um, so far from having 2,000 independent draws from f of x, at the end of the day, we've got uh, an, uh, some um, much smaller number of uh, effectively independent samples from x uh, that go into um, all of these points here. But if we run this for long enough, um, eventually uh, we'll get a good characterization. Okay. Um, so this is all well and good to plot these figures for um, for values like x, which is just this arbitrary real number. Um, but how do we do this sort of thing for trees? Well, what we can do is is just look at summary statistics of the trees. So for instance, here is a histogram um, resulting from an MCMC analysis where we plotted the tree height. So this is the age of the um, most cre recent common ancestor of all of our samples. Um, and uh, this is a real number, so we can get some marginal posterior distribution for this um, visualized quite easily. Um, we can also try to uh, depict the posterior distribution of the trees themselves, um, but uh, by, by doing things like trying to plot them all on top of each other, uh, which is sort of a fun exercise, but it's it can be difficult to interpret once there's a um, a large amount of uh, uncertainty there. Okay, so we've only got a few more minutes, but I'm going to quickly talk about um, a uh, application of these methods to some uh, SARS-CoV-2 data. So. Uh, the focus of this application is to infer the so-called basic reproductive number, or R0, um, for a number of different uh, SARS-CoV-2 outbreaks um, that were occurring across the world at the beginning of uh, 2020. Um, and this basic reproductive number, uh, you've probably seen, uh, even if you'd never heard of it before in a scientific context, it's, it's, it was appearing in the news quite often over the last few years. So you probably have a rough idea of what it means, um, but it represents the average number of secondary transmissions resulting from a host uh, in a completely naive population. So you imagine that a, 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 an infected host appears in a population that has, has no other infected hosts, 
and you consider the um, the number of secondary uh, transmissions that that host would be responsible for. And if you consider that the average or expected number of, of uh, such transmissions, this would be the, the basic reproductive number. Um, so it's useful because if it's if it's one and if it's if it's below one, you is on average expect the um, um, the outbreak to just die out. Um, if it's above one, then on average, uh, it's going to um, um, exponentially grow. Uh, and the way in which this is often estimated are based on uh, just case counts, recorded case counts. So, so if you look at so uh, the the number of um, um, detected cases in a population through time, uh, you can basically look at the the rate of of growth of this curve and try to fit an exponential uh, distribution uh, exponential um, uh, growth uh, curve to it and uh, and figure out the rate that way. Um, but of course, this is uh, contingent on you having good estimates of the case counts. Um, however, there are other ways to do it. And in particular, there are ways to do it involving uh, follow dynamics. So uh, soon after SARS-CoV-2 emerged, various institutions began sharing genomic sequences on the GISAID platform. Um, and this was extremely useful because they had the potential to yield much more robust estimates of R0 via file dynamics. Um, so this particular analysis involved uh, a number of different outbreaks uh, from a number of different uh, countries, including not a country down here, but a cruise ship, the Diamond Princess. Um, so we had a, a fairly small number of sequences uh, from many of these outbreaks. But um, but still enough to, to start considering doing these analyses. Um, and the important point about uh, the sequences that we included in the analysis was that we chose them so that uh, the last sequence included was prior to uh, the implementation of any uh, real public health measures. Um, so the goal here was to infer the um, uh, the the transmission rate in the uh, completely naive population uh, without sort of, uh, public health measures. So something which should be more equality of the virus itself rather than um, um, virus plus uh, these other measures. Um, there were lots of challenges early in the uh, dynamic in the epidemic for um, this sort of uh, inference. So that main challenge was limited diversity. So a lot of the sequences looked very similar. Um, sample collection itself is always full of unknown biases. And when you don't have many samples, this is uh, this can be a real problem. Um, sequencing errors at this point weren't well characterized, uh, which is also obviously be a problem. All of this is to say that you have to be very careful interpreting these results. Um, so we analyzed these sequences using this birth death skyline model. So not a coalescent model, this birth uh, death uh, sampling model, but one in which the uh, rates were allowed to change through time. Um, and it, we assumed that each outbreak evolved independently from a single introduction under this um, birth death sampling process. As I said, we're interested in this basic reproductive number. And uh, to that end, we use a more epidemiologically focused parameterization. So instead of uh, thinking in terms of birth rates and death rates, we instead thought in terms of reproductive number, which is just the, the birth rate divided by the death rate. Um, and uh, this um, um, become an infectious rate, which is uh, it combines both the sampling rate and the, um, the the removal rate, death rate. By the way, death here doesn't necessarily mean death. It means um, in, in a biological sense, it means uh, just removal from the population. Um, so quarantining an individual also counts as as mathematical death in this sense. Okay, uh, so we we actually fix the the removal rate to. 10 days, um, which based on information we had at the, the time was a sensible choice. And we placed uh, weekly informative priors on the other parameters. And 
long story short, this is the result. So we were able to do this joint analysis of all of these sequences together. Uh, some of these parameters were shared, but we allowed uh, to be shared amongst the outbreaks, but um, for the most part, uh, they had independent R0 values, obviously, um, and independent sampling proportions. Um, and you can see that uh, there are lots of outbreaks that have very similar values, uh, somewhere around two. Uh, these are posterior distributions, by the way. These are marginal posterior distributions of the R0 values um, for each of these outbreaks. Um, and uh, but you also see some of these outbreaks have much larger values, uh, and we in at least uh, four of these cases we believe these are uh, um, artifacts of the the sampling process, uh, and the evidence for this is just looking at the um, the distribution of sample times that went into each of these analyses, and we see that. Um, the uh, outbreaks with very large inferred R0 are the ones with very tiny sampling windows. So we really believe that this is this is the reason behind those results. Um, that's all I'm really going to say about this application. I'm sorry, it was very short. I didn't have a lot of time. But um, the take-home me message here is that um, these epidemiological parameters can be inferred from genetic data, and I don't think that's necessarily obvious unless you, you really think about it. Um, these inferences are complementary to inferences of parameters from traditional case count data, and the reason they're complementary is that um, they don't just rely on the, the, the times uh, and numbers of, of observed cases uh, that we have, um, but also the timing of these inferred mission events that occur way back in the tree. Um, so they can be less biased, but they do remain susceptible to sampling biases because our follow dynamic model also includes sampling rates necessarily. Um, they're also better equipped generally to deal with confounding factors such as the existence of travel cases. So once you have a phylogeny, it's much easier to say, all right, it's very clear that this sample um, does not sort of fall within our tree, but comes from elsewhere um, and thus shouldn't be included in the analysis. Okay, I know that was extremely quick. Does anyone have any um, questions about the application or any of the other points I've raised so far? Okay, well, if not, I'm going to uh, shift then onto the quick tutorial. Um, so I just want to talk briefly about Beast 2. So Beast 2 is a free software package uh, that does this MCMC um, to perform Bayesian phylogenetic and phylogenetic inference. Uh, you can get it from this website here. There's, uh, the, uh, there's a lot of documentation there as well, and there are some tutorials. But there's also a dedicated tutorial website tamingthebeast.org um, that our group here is primarily responsible for. And uh, that contains a much larger and uh, more heavily curated uh, set of tutorials um, for the software. Okay, so Beast 2 itself is the software that implements the MCMC. Um, there's a portion of the software called Beauty, uh, Beauty and the Beast. Um, that uh, provides a GUI for setting up uh, the, the analysis input file. Um, there's some software called Tracer that that's useful for summarizing parameter posteriors. Um, there's a tree annotator program that takes the, this large set of sampled trees from the, the tree posterior and tries to um, produce summary trees from those, um, from those sampled trees. Uh, fig tree is uh, a different tool. Uh, it's not within uh, the, the beast ecosystem, but it's used a lot by beast users for visualizing trees. And these things all fit together uh, in this way. So you have your sequence data, you fire up beauty, you load in your sequence data, set up a model. This produces an XML file that contains all of the details, uh, including your sequence data. Um, that, that specify the analysis, and you feed that into Beast 2. Um, 
Usually you'll be running BEAST2 on a cluster if this is a, a, a real production analysis because this, this MCMC process can take a while. Um, and then once BEAST2 is complete, uh, it will be producing this uh, log file, which contains a um, uh, the set of uh, uh, sampled parameter values and also this trees file, which is essentially a log file, but, but, also, but just for the phylogenetic trees. And uh, these are then uh, fed into the uh, appropriate programs for analysis. So uh, I know we only have a very short amount of time, 23 minutes maybe, um, but at this point, I'd like to encourage you to download and install uh, Beast 2, at least if, if you can, uh, just, just try, to, uh, try to get this installed uh, from beast2.org. Um, open the Taming the Beast page and locate the Introduction to Beast 2 tutorial. Um, and given that we don't have time, <laughs> uh, I'd encourage you to just focus on the gray boxes that actually tell you uh, within that tutorial exactly what you need to do. Um, we don't have time to read all of the text. Obviously, the text is important and interesting, and I would encourage you, if you are interested, uh, to go back and, and complete this tutorial properly, but um, um, but for the purposes of just getting familiar with things, I think it's not necessary. Um, uh, and I see uh, in the chat, these links have been shared. So um, thank you very much, Patricia. Um, and so I'm going to give you uh, a small amount of time to to try to actually at, at least just get started on this tutorial and then a few minutes before half past maybe maybe five minutes before I'm not sure I, I'd like to give you a little bit more time than you, you would have otherwise um, I'll wrap up the tutorial and just briefly go through the tutorial results um, so that at least everyone gets a chance to see roughly what the output looks like this was this was the tutorial um, uh, the first bit is mostly about installing the software and understanding um, how to load the data. Um, so the first thing uh, you're involved with is this beauty uh, program that I mentioned, uh, where we load in this uh, primate mitochondrial DNA data in this tutorial um, and set things up in this panel so that we're sharing we have several different partitions. These correspond to the different codon positions um, of characters because uh, um, we expect those uh, codon positions to be experiencing different evolutionary rates. So we want to keep them separate. And obviously also the non-coding portion of the uh, sequence uh, is separate as well. Um, okay, but they share the same tree. Um, they just uh, have different uh, substitution models associated with them. Um, all of these samples are occurring at the same time, so there's no tip dates to set up. We set up a uh, site model uh, for these uh, different um, different partitions. This site model is is the substitution model uh, from from the uh, from the lecture. Um, and here we've chosen HKY for all of these, um, and uh, we've um, we've basically. Uh, um, allowed them to, uh, to, to vary their overall rates. Um, the clock model, again, this is not something I, I talked about, but um, we're assuming a strict clock. This is the simplest uh, case. This would basically allow us to let the overall rate of evolutionary change um, um, itself change over the tree to some extent. Um, but in our case, we're going to keep it fixed. The priors is where a lot of the, the sort of twiddling happens with setting up a beast analysis. In this case, we've chosen a particular tree prior. This is essentially a birth death kind of model, um, this calibrated Yule model. Um, and the important thing here is that we've also put explicitly a prior on the date of the uh, divergence between humans and chimps. And we've put this, we, we've, we've said that this is going to be distributed according to a normal distribution at, uh, with a mean of 6 million years ago and a particular standard deviation. Um, there's a little bit to say about this, this particular kind of calibration. Uh, it doesn't, it's, it's sort of a little bit of a fudge uh, due to the fact that there's um, uh, no other information about the 
the absolute timing of uh, events in this phylogeny if we don't include this uh, this calibration. Um, but uh, just just be aware it's it's um, it's something that you have to be a little bit careful about. Um, the last thing that was set up was just some some details of the MCMC through the number of steps and the number of uh, uh, times the the MCMC state was written to disk. And just remember that uh, we always have these um, different kinds of logs. So this trace log in this case is is just logging the parameters of um, the model that we're inferring. The tree log is the same thing, but it's it's uh, it's it's specifically logging the the trees themselves. Um, okay, and if we save that analysis, it produces an XML file, this primates.xml file, um, and we run it using uh, Beast. I'm not going to to show what that looks like. It's pretty boring if everything is working correctly. Um, it's non-interactive. Um, and then at the end of the day, um, once the analysis is complete, in this case, it's extremely fast because it's a very simple analysis, but in general, it could take a lot longer. Um, we get this log file and we get a tree file. And the log file, we can load into Tracer. We could also load it directly into R. Um, it's just a, a, a flat uh, text table um, with columns corresponding to the different parameters and each row corresponding to a sample from the MCMC. Um, uh, but in Tracer, we get this nice sort of visualization with all of the parameters uh, or summary statistics. They're not all real parameters um, in this table on the left-hand side. And we can select them. Uh, we can see we have things like the tree height here. And if we click this trace on the right-hand side, we see that the tree height starts from some value. We can see this burn-in period here that I mentioned. Um, and then it oscillates. And this is sort of what we're looking for in MCMC, this fuzzy caterpillar sort of um, picture where the, uh, we don't have any sort of long-term trends. Um, but in case we don't believe our eyes, we can also look at this ESS value, which is the effective sample size uh, estimate. So we, this aims to, to estimate how many independent samples you have. And note we've got some parameters here that are colored red. Uh, this is indicating that we don't actually have a very large number of uh, effectively independent samples here, and we might want to run the chain a bit longer. Um, the tutorial gets us to compare some of these uh, parameters. These are the mutation rates corresponding to these different partitions, um, the first, second, third codon positions, and the non-coding. Uh, this is actually the third codon position that has the elevated rate. The non-coding, uh, we can add a legend um, the non-coding is actually over here and it says a similar rate to um, the, the first and second codon positions, um, which is interesting. Okay, and then the, the tree itself, uh, we've got this, this tree file that we can load into. Um, firstly, I'm, I'm going to show you what, what it looks like when you load this tree file into this density tree program. These are the, um, the posterior samples of the estimated of, of the time trees. The, so this is a visualization of the marginal posterior um, uh, for the phylogenetic trees. Um, these these uh, trees here are just plotted on, on top of each other with some amount of transparency. So you get some indication of the uncertainty in the timing of these different events. But you can see that these trees all agree very, very nicely. Um, in particular, the topology here is, is basically the same for every tree. Um, that appears here. Um, another way we can look at these trees is we can take this tree file, process it with tree annotator, which is described in the tutorial, and then um, produce this so-called um, maximum clade credibility summary tree. Uh, and that's what we see here. Um, this is visualized in fig tree. And uh, this has been, uh, so this is a summary of the full um, sampled posterior. Um, and we can see, for instance, this uh, this human uh, chimp divergence time. This is essentially the prior that we placed on this this time. Um, this these bars represent the uncertainty in the divergence times, and the numbers here represent. I'm not sure if you can see them very well, but they're um, almost all one, and they're representing the posterior probability that this particular clade uh, appears in 
uh, the um, uh, samples from the posterior. So one means that it, it appeared in all of them. Um, and this is basically the, the case for all of these clades. And this is just representing this, this fact that we saw in, in density tree that the topology is very nicely resolved here. There is one clade here that we see uh, must have had some, some, one of the trees in the posterior, um, uh, one of the samples from the posterior must have um, not had this particular uh, clade in, in, in the tree. Um, so it's got a, a posterior probability of 0 0.9967. So anyway, very close to one still. Um, that is essentially it. There's a lot more to bees. Uh, what we haven't um, seen in this tutorial really at all is the phylogenomic aspect, although of course there are um, birth rates being inferred here as well. So this is, this is um, I, I guess, fundamentally phylogenomics, but uh, we haven't done anything like try to infer the dynamics of uh, population size through time or anything like that. Um, if you're interested in this, uh, for sure, go back to uh, this um, Taming the Beast, Taming the Beast uh, webpage. Uh, you'll see there's a wide variety of tutorials here. Um, including uh, models that um, uh, describe how to infer um, population dynamics through time. Uh, so with that, I know I'm five minutes over. I'm very sorry for eating into your coffee break, um, but thank you very much for um, sticking with me.